Manalo has not grown as, as much as other towns. I think it's because of the fact that uh, we have a lot of agricultural zonings in this area mixed with the Hawaiian homestead lands. So it has been slow to grow as compared to other towns in, in the state. I've been a Waimanalo resident for 30 years. I think there has to be some places on this earth that just stays, you know, regular, you have to be able to enjoy what's out there. Historically, uh, Waimanao was mainly a sugar plantation type of uh, or agricultural type of uh, community. And later on, uh, during the war years, the uh, uh, military took over what is called a Bellows Field. And during that time, population was very small. It only uh, included uh, mostly plantation workers, Filipinos, uh, Japanese, and a uh, little mix of Hawaiians. And I guess through these people, you know, they established themselves in, in, in the community. Population started to grow, and when they introduced the Hawaiian homelands, you know, the Hawaiian population started to grow over here also. Polo in Waimanalo, I think, is very exciting. Polo in Hawaii, has a very long history, going back over 100 years. Uh, polo, I think, originally came to Hawaii about the same time as it began to make its international trek out of India and, and Asia. Um, right, in Hawaii today, we have polo clubs uh, here on Oahu, on Kauai, Maui, and on the Big Island. And in terms of the types of clubs that we have here in Hawaii. I got involved with Waimanalo Polo Club primarily because I was attracted to a group of guys who had, I guess, a vision of starting a players club. Uh, Waimanalo Polo Club primarily consists, is managed and operated and run by polo players, active polo players who get a lot of enjoyment um, and a lot of um, pleasure out of participating in this sport. There are other clubs in Hawaii who are also players clubs as well as clubs that are primarily profit oriented at this time towards a product or a specific uh, goal or event. But here in Waimanalo, as you can see around the Kolau Mountains, the beautiful uh, scenery along Kalani on Ole Highway, it's the perfect setting for polo in Hawaii and it kind of gives the polo players in Waimanalo, that special sense that they're part of the Waimanalo community. Hardest part of hitting the ball, I would say the neck shot, trying to make a neck shot where you take the ball underneath your pony's nose and running at speed, his legs are interfering with the shot. Uh, it's a rather expensive shot if you hit those legs. I think the polo in Waimanalo will continue to grow uh, here in Hawaii, we have been blessed with uh, terrific Hawaiian cowboys, the Paniolo cowboy, and uh, the prerequisite for polo is riding, and uh, it seems like the Hawaiian cowboys uh, do quite well in the rodeo circuit here in Hawaii and on the mainland. So I look for polo to be getting stronger with local talent and not necessarily imported uh, polo players. And some of the problems, you know, we have so many people on uh, applicants who are trying to get on the land, become uh, at least leasehold low holders on Hawaiian Homes Commission land, but there's not enough land to go around for all the Hawaiians. And this is one issue we're worried about. Another issue is our, originally uh, the lease calls for a 99-year lease 
for every you know, person that is awarded a lease. And <clears throat> the leases, within the next 35 years, the leases are going to start to expire. And in the act itself, it does not say what happens to the, the people, what happens to the people after the lease expires. And we want to address that concern so that if uh, then when it does expire, we have something to fall back on. Right now, the way it looks, uh, if uh, we don't do anything about it, there is a probability that we might lose the lease and then you know, we may have to leave the land. Living in Waimanali really inspires one by all its beauty that surrounds you. You, know, you, it's, you have the mountain back of you that's just, just about all around you, the ocean there in the front of you. I mean, everything like that is definitely will take away your breath, you know, and it's, it's something that you really can't and don't appreciate until you leave and go elsewhere that you really, you know, come back and then, gee, how much you really appreciate all its beauty, its natural beauty. But in Waimanalo, we have a lot, you know, a lot of this, uh, the vegetation that's all around of us, you know, I mean, it's, I hope they never, ever Bill Waimanalo. I hope they live it just the way it is. Because as you can see, Kailua, Kaneohe, they're all built up. And Waimanalo, I think, just the way it is, I hope it stays that way. Never. You know, we have farms in the back. We have our cows, our horses, that's all back of us. We got all of this in the back of our yard. And um, if you come down that way, you even find our billy goats running around on the road. <laughs> you know, so they're just, I just love it, you know. And this is why I love Waimanalo, for its natural beauty. You know, it's still there. And it just, um, it's something that you can just, you know, you can't do in town, in Honolulu, in, in Kaneohe, some places you can't raise your animals back there. So the ocean, we have beautiful ocean, and it just, that there just inspires one. And when I put that all together with the hula, you, you can just feel it, you know, you can just feel all of that. And without it, I don't think it can, it can happen. But um, it makes it a little easier when you dance, when you teach, you know, it's to go out there and look at what we have that's around of us, around us. And, Put it together, and I think that will that kind of inspires you even more. Sea Life Park was established uh, 25 years ago in 1964. Sea Life was the dream of Karen and Tab Pryor. They were the people who put the concept together and brought it to fruition. In terms of employment, or in terms of the people that work at the park, the park has made a, 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 near, a real honest effort to hire people from the community. Consequently, um, a fairly substantial number of people that work at the park are from the area of Waimanalo, um, either born and raised in the area or live in the area. Um, we're proud of that. We're happy about that um, because we do see ourselves as being um, a Waimanalo, part of the Waimanalo community. Well, working on Sea Life Park is is something that a lot of people that live in Waimanalo do. Um, I personally have worked at Sea Life for about 20 years, and I've lived in Waimanalo for about the same amount of time. It is, of course, very convenient. It's very handy. Uh, sea Life employs folks doing everything from animal work to office work uh, to logistical operations type support. Pretty much the spectrum of jobs are held by folks from Waimanalo. And I think over the years the park has and continues to attempt to hire from the community whenever possible. 
in addition to being a wonderful place to, to work, of course, Waimanalo, for those, those of us that live here, is a, is a delightful place to live. <laughs> but we don't want anyone to know that. <laughs> At Sea Life, we're, of course, primarily concerned with marine life. And in my department, which is the training department, um, our, our primary, primary animals that we take care of are marine mammals. Uh, dolphins and whales and seals and sea lions and marine birds, seabirds. Many of the birds nest on the offshore islands uh, off of the windward coast. So it's kind of a natural place to, to have uh, a, a seabird colony. Um, and we do, we do collect for our colony both from the, the northwest, the Leeward Isles, and also sometimes off of the, off of the uh, colonies here on Oahu. This is kind of like our, our bird hospital here. Um, we take in all injured seabirds. Now these guys are all have all have their own story. They're here for one reason or another. These two in particular, right here, these are brown birdies. As you can see, they're real hungry. Being seabirds, they eat fish or squid. This is the um, smell I'm feeding them right now. But these two are a result of an oil spill, and it must be somewhere off the west end of Oahu. Um, they have been through, they look fine now, but they have been through a series of uh, bats, bird bats. We, I'd say the total for each one is close to 10 bats each. So they were pretty um, covered when they came in. Now the oil, I can see what the people in Alaska are going through right now because the oil, at least for these guys, what it does is it destroys their reproductive system. So they can't have, you know, kids unless they're you know, taken care of right away. Also, it, it uh, keeps the, it clogs up all their preening or their oil to waterproof their feathers. They might not be seabirds anymore, you know, unless the right steps are taken. What I'm doing here at Sea Life Park is I'm one of the trainers here and we uh, take care of the animals as well as uh, train them for all our shows here at Sea Life Park and uh, I really enjoy it. I've been here for a while. Uh, I work all the, some of the dolphins and some of the sea lions. Uh, the dolphins are a lot of fun to work because they're uh, uh, they're very much like working your your house cat, uh, very independent animals, as opposed to working with sea lions, which are like training your 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 dog at home. And uh, it's very enjoyable work. I've been doing it for 17 years, and uh, I wouldn't do anything else. It's uh, highly enjoyable. Good boy. I've lived in Waimanalo, I guess, most of. My years, I went to school at Waimanalo uh, Elementary and uh, Kailua High. And um, right after getting out of high school, I started here at Sea Life Park. And, um, you know, at that time I thought, well, I'm going to only be here a year. But I've enjoyed working here so much that the years have just kind of rolled by. And it's 20 years now that I've been at Sea Life Park. And um, living in Waimanalo, I don't want to live anywhere else. We're real fortunate to be here. This is definitely one of the best flying sites in, in the world today. Uh, there's a lot of different types of sites. For a cliff site, a soaring site like this, it's probably the very best. Uh, there's other mountain sites and thermal sites that are just like comparing apples and oranges are quite different. So we fly in pretty much anything from, from no wind, where we can fly in thermals, to up to about 20 miles an hour of uh, trade winds. Anything from north to East, quite east. It's nice to come and watch a, a launch or to watch a landing, but once you've done that, you've seen it all because the guy goes away. And it, it's a real personal sport. Everybody flies for a different reason and uh, gets a different type of satisfaction from it. N no one better or greater than the other. Yeah, so, uh, and the sport's not for everyone. There's, um, I don't, it takes a certain type of person, a person that is really driven to want to fly. It's not something you, I don't think you'd go out and do on a whim. Because uh, you actually have to become a pilot. And it's just not for everybody. This is without question one of the, the finest riders on the market. It's called a uh, Sensor 510C VG. This one you can change the shape of the sail in the air. Like trimming the sail of a sailboat. Right, this this is the parachute. It's a, a 22 gore reserve parachute. I believe it's a 24, 26 foot canopy. And again, it's just for for those minutes that uh, it's a last resort type type of thing. 
and then the harness, your whole body fits in the harness and supports your entire length of your body. It has storage containers to take whatever you, you might like to take with you. A radio holder for when we fly cross country, we like to fly with radios. And that's about it. This is a, uh, where the harness actually hooks into the, uh, to the hang glider and the bridle to the parachute. So if you're in a situation where you throw your chute, you actually come down with the hang glider. So you, the hang glider, everything comes down under the, the parachute. So you don't have it banging around in residential areas without you. This is a, a variometer. And what it does is it measures your vertical speed in feet per minute. How many, uh, how fast you're going up or down. And the scale runs, of course, uh, from 1,500 feet a minute up to 1,500 feet a minute down. And it has an, an audio as well as visual, so you don't have to be looking at it all the time to find out uh, how fast up or down you're going. And it just helps in, in a lot of your calculations. If you're traveling from point A to B, it lets you know how fast you're sinking so you can kind of figure if you're going to make your goal. And if you're working thermal or lift, it lets you know just how fast, if it's worth working, if it's strong enough or... Uh, it's just an aid. You can certainly fly without them. But it's a nice aid to have. to get closer, but uh, there's, there's less wind down here than I thought. It was kind of a classic, perfect flying day. Some of the concerns of our community is what happens to our land. Uh, we have uh, the general in, and developmental plans which the county, city and county have established, have the mandated that the land here be kept as much as possible and in rural and in agriculture and that, and that they not be covered with houses and would not be urbanized. And so our neighborhood board has tried to stick by that. And that means that we have been in conflict with the developers. These islands are small. They can't go on developing forever. They can't take the world's population here. We're overcrowded right now as it is. We maintain that somewhere along the line, we've got to stand back and say, no, no more. This rodeo was started eight years ago uh, for the a benefit for Habilitat, which is a drug rehabilitation center here in Hawaii, uh, and they've got uh, people that come to it from all over the all over the country. It's uh, a fundraiser for them, and uh, it's just a great community project that we have going here. The uh, rodeo itself is uh, considered a professional championship rodeo. We have uh, real good bucking horses and bulls. Uh, we raise our own livestock that we use for the double mugging, which is a local event, uh, an event that was started here in Hawaii. Uh, and we use also for the team roping. Most of our participants are local people, although we do have uh, a lot of participants that come from the mainland. Uh, this example this year, we have Jim Sharp, who is the uh, 1988 World Champion Bull Rider. I'm Jim Sharp. Uh, I'm from Kermit, Texas. I'm the 1988 World Champion Bull Rider. And uh, I've been in Hawaii for about four days. 
been out on the beach swimming, had a lot of fun. All the people I meet here have been super nice. And uh, shoot, I can't say nothing, but I, I love it. I got to go home in a couple of days and I'm not even ready for it. I watch the other bulls they have here and I think it's really good, you know. For, uh, you know, I don't guess they have as many rodeos over here as they do where I live, but so far, you know, this, what, of what I've seen, the stock's been really good, and the cowboys, they ride, they ride pretty tough, too. And the bull riding, you know, you, you don't really watch for anything, you know. The challenge is whether you can just stay on the bull for the full eight seconds or not. And um, some bulls, you know, are tougher to ride, you know, the ones that spin are a little tougher, but I'd say, you know, guys just try to stay on them. Well, I started riding, I started riding my dad's roping calves when I was about five years old, you know. He, he roped calves for just the fun of it. He'd rope them and tie them. When he untied them, I'd get on them and ride them to the other end of the pen. And uh, I started in junior rodeos when I was about nine years old and rode in there for about ten years. I rode in amateur rodeos for about five, and then I got my pro card when I was 20. Uh, I was a 1986 Rookie of the Year, and uh, I don't know, ever since I can remember, I always wanted to be a bull rider, and I was real lucky and was always around it, and so here I am today. Also, we have uh, a young fellow that is a local boy. He's the Hawaii uh, champion bull rider, and I think he's uh, in the top 15 for the college the intercollegiate uh, rodeo finals. He, uh, Myron Ward is his name. probably the closest country that you'll see to Honolulu. I mean, in 20, 25 minutes, you're over the hill and you're, you're in the, the big city. The, the horse industry in Hawaii is just growing leaps and bounds. Over the last, probably, uh, we've been here at Newtown and Country Stables for 25 years. This past February made 25 years. Uh, my dad started the uh, Saddle City years ago, here over 35 years ago. And uh, he put on rodeos there and they had a lot of horse shows and so forth. There's several stables throughout the uh, throughout the valley. Uh, Circle Z is one of them. They have a real nice facility. It's a new facility. They have a lot of the English and dressage shows there. Uh, there's other stables around that board. Uh, our basic thing here is that we board and train uh, horses for people and uh, a lot of children in the in the Western Division. Uh, the rodeo business here. Getting back to the rodeo business in Hawaii. Uh, the rodeo business has been going on for years. It's uh, you might say uh, we're the farthest western state in the union, and so you can say that we're probably the most, most westerner people there is. I think the people love coming here. It takes them back, you know, a few years, and they get to come and, and, uh, and see the country life. And uh, uh, we've got a beautiful scenery here, as you can see. When you're in the bleachers and you're sitting there, uh, you look out across the arena. Uh, you've got a beautiful golf course across the street, and you've got the ocean out behind it. Uh, you, I don't think you could find a prettier setting for a rodeo any place. I'm not 